When it comes to open class competitors at World Time Attack Challenge, there's no shortage of high-end builds. However, one clear standout for us is the Dream Projects S15. We're here with Charles, owner and builder of this S15, to find out what makes it tick. So for a start, Charles, let's just talk about World Time Attack Challenge in general. And over the years we've been coming here, we've seen two things really dominate, power and aero. You've definitely got aero, and we'll get into that. But interestingly here, you've gone with the SR20 based engine, and a lot of the competitors in the S chassis will go with an RB30, RB26, so more capacity, more cylinders. Can you tell us what drove you to stick to the SR20? Yeah, so I mean, we just wanted to keep it, uh, you know, keep it light, keep the balance where we want it to be. You know, the motors, you know, the four cylinder is perfect for this chassis. You know, putting in a, you know, a two J or an RB just wouldn't be right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fit well. You know, there's so many other compromises that come from that with your cooling systems and things like that. The flow on, um, so yeah, and also just sticking, uh, you know, close to Murray. You know, the guys involved. Uh, in this car, you know, obviously involved in, you know, the, the Hammerhead and all the Queensland, you know, barrier. So you're talking Mar Murray Coates there, builder and owner of the Hammerhead, just to give yeah. some reference there. Yeah, correct. Yeah, Murray Coates, yeah. So, um, so yeah, very happy with the little four-cylinder there and um, it, it's power-wise, it does everything we need it to do. All right, so one of the things there, basically you're saying you've, your focus there has not been on outright power. You're looking for a well-balanced, lightweight chassis and the advantage with that four-cylinder over an RB or a 2JZ is, is it's a lot shorter and a lot lighter. Uh, on top of that though, we can see you've also moved the engine back a long way in the chassis. So can you tell us what the rules allow there and have you exploited that to the absolute maximum? <laughs> this, this car is obviously you know built to the current rules, uh, to the maximum. Uh, 51 millimetres uh, is the uh, the, the amount we can move an engine back in open class and uh, that's exactly where it's at basically so um, you know we, we've got to take advantage of everything if we leave anything you know out you know any margin out there then you know we could you know be beaten by the next car you know so we've got to take advantage of every opportunity we can and that's the beauty of starting with a build from scratch is you can do all that stuff yeah. All right, so we talked about the fact you've gone the SR instead of the a bigger capacity engine, but it's still no slouch. How much power is it producing at the moment? Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, a little stout, little uh, 2.2 uh, 2 .2 litre um, stroked uh, SR20, little V cylinder head. So, I mean, that's 900 horsepower, 34 pounds of boost. Um, at this point, we're sort of running out of turbo and, um, you know, but I mean, 900 horsepower, I mean, when, the, when I got the brief uh, for the build, you know, 800 horsepower was what I was asked to, to supply and uh, we're, we're well and truly over that. So, you know, you know, look, horsepower isn't everything. Obviously it helps, but you know, we've, we've got a very happy balance. So we'll see how we go. Now getting into that, getting a reliable 900 wheel horsepower out of a SR20 is, is no mean feat, even if you're going to a 2.2 stroker yeah. kit. Uh, so billet block here, can you tell us about the componentry inside the engine that you're using to keep that reliable? Yeah, so first thing we did is, you know, got in touch with uh, top guys uh, in Australia and, you know, Peter McDonald from PMC Race Engines. Uh, you know, I've dealt with him for a long time back in my, you know, first car, you know, my Datsun and had an RB in there. And, you know, we the, the first thing we built on this car was was the motor. It was just like we started building a motor and then the car came together after that. And, um, yeah, so we've got a, you know, P12 V cylinder head um, with uh, some Kelford cams. Um, and we've got a Nitto 2.2-litre uh, stroker kit. Uh, with some CP pistons, uh, look fairly simple to be honest. It's uh, there's nothing too outlandish, um, and at this point we haven't really had an issue with anything, and it's been the most reliable, most reliable part of the car. It's unbelievable, yeah. Now off camera before you were saying that so far it's been running for that running at that sort of power level, and I think you said you'd done in excess of 100 laps with yeah. no reliability problems. Yeah, obviously not a hot, hot laps, but we've been circulating. We've done four tests um, in Queensland Raceway and then here as well, and. We haven't put a spanner on the car and, you know, that's a tribute to the preparation of the car. You know, the GD Auto Garage boys have just gone above and beyond um, with their attention to detail and, uh, yeah, it's been a real dream dream run for us. Yeah. Of course, it's worth mentioning here that the, the billet blocks at, at the pointy end, the, these engines are really designed around sort of power levels 1500 and, and well above. So you're ultimately not stressing them that much, but circuit racing versus drag racing uh, is a very different amount of stress on the engine. Now, you just mentioned before that you were essentially out of turbocharger. Can you tell us what the turbo on the engine is? Yeah, so it's a Borg Warner FR 9174. Uh, with a 1.05 rear housing, I think. Um, so yeah, just running running out of puff. It's just ta it's it's just getting harder to make boost after 34 pounds. So it's, you know, there's no point trying to stress the limit on that and um, keep it in the happy happy space. And that's sort of where it's at. And yeah, for us the power that's that's we got more than enough. Yeah. 
Those EFR turbos as well, well known that they do have a maximum RPM above which you do risk uh, the, the turbo basically falling to pieces. Uh, are you monitoring turbo speed and if so how close are you to that, that, that maximum speed? Yes, we are monitoring the turbo speed. We've got a little sensor on the front of the board warner um, that's controlled through the MoTeC. And uh, yeah, we I think we're still quite a, a little bit under. Um, and that's the biggest, one of the parts of the decision making process for the 9174 is because of that turbo wheel speed. And these little uh, SRs on high boosts really do run them hard. So the 9174 was the better option. There is other, obviously the 9180, the bigger, bigger turbo, but that 9174 can spin a bit harder than that turbo. So that was the choice. Uh, moving on through the drivetrain, what's the transmission you've got backing up that engine? Yep, so we've got a Hollinger RD6 um, sequential, so uh, with the strain gauge knob, so that's uh, perfectly suited for this uh, this car, yeah. So that strain gauge gear knob feeds into the ECU, allowing the driver for clutchless upshifts? Correct, that's correct. And that's pretty important as well with these yeah. big turbos on relatively small engines, keeping the, the turbo on full boost during the shift? Yes, exactly right, and downshift, it's rev matching and things like that, so it's just really, really nice for the driver. So that rev matching is there automatically done through the ECU and a drive-by-wire throttle as well? Yes, correct, that is right, yeah. So allowing the driver there to concentrate solely on getting maximum braking performance? Exactly, yeah, you can you take time on the clutch, not have to worry about that too much and really focus on that braking, yeah. All right, so can we talk just briefly here about the electronics package? What have you got controlling the engine and the rest of the electronics in the car? Yep, so we've got a MoTeC M150 ECU. Um, it's controlled through a PDM 30, um, and obviously all the little bits and pieces that go along with that. Um, obviously a custom motorsport wiring loom for the whole car. Um, we've got quite a few sensors, not, 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 not more than we need, but we've got you know shock potentiometers on all the corners and wheel speed sensors and all that sort of stuff to get that vital data that you need to put down a quick lap. Uh, now for those who aren't familiar with the terminology there, you mentioned the, the MoTeC PDM, so power distribution module, just yes. a, a unit there essentially, yes. solid state electronics that gets rid of fuses and relays, great for reliability. Yes. And I noticed you've got that keypad controlling all of those functions on the dash. Yes, yes, got the keypad there. So that was the biggest thing for us is, you know, get the right parts once you know minimize uh you know fuses blowing and things like that you know the pdm is just perfect and it's, it's the right technology to use and it just makes life so much easier and you've got the motec c127 in there as is a driver display yes. uh, you're also using that as a central logging hub yep got the logging through that and the driver display um so it's easy to read keeps everything in there and uh, gives the driver any warnings any feedback if there's anything going wrong now again, in terms of, we've already mentioned the, the fact you're aiming for a lightweight car that's well balanced and part of that is getting the weight as close to the centre line of the car as you can and uh, is that the, the driver there behind the location of the fuel tank, the fuel cell as well as the dry sump tank? Yes, so obviously everything about this car has been a decision, there's been no guessing. Um, everything that's put in there is put in, in that spot for a reason, um, CFG, all that sort of thing, um, offsetting the driver weight. Um, so, you know, that gets on to obviously you know Barry Locke, uh, the engineer, designing the entire car from start to finish. Um, every part of it, um, there's a drawing for it, so that's uh, that's where it's at. Yeah. Now again, for our international viewers, Barry Locke is uh, a pretty big name here in Australian motorsport, but of course our international viewers probably got no idea who he is, but uh, also instrumental with the design of the MCA Hammerhead, which is probably one of the the yeah. fastest cars here, uh, particularly in the pro class. Yeah. So uh, let's just talk about some of the elements that Barry has designed for the car and. And, and how that's come to be and uh, of course you can't really um, sort of look over the aero on the car again I mentioned at the start this has su become such a big part of, of World Time Attack Challenge so can you talk about that aero package how that was developed and, and what it's providing in terms of downforce? Yeah so I suppose we obviously early stages got in touch with Barry um, and Barry took control of you know freedom with uh, his pen and paper or pencil and uh, paper and uh, you know started with the chassis setup and chassis design um, and then obviously moving on to the aero design uh, you know it, this car was sort of built over a couple of years it was a, like obviously developing as we got to the next stage so it wasn't all just done first and then made later it was sort of okay let's get let's get the front end sorted let's get the rear end sorted okay well now it's done let's move on to the aero or the uprights or wherever we needed to go so yeah I think that's um, something that so many people overlook as well it, it's a lot of money goes into building a car at this level even at a grassroots level it's still a lot of money but you can save yourself so much money if you start from the beginning with a complete picture of the finished car and only build things once rather than going through and modifying things time and time again. So it's a pretty smart way of doing it. Uh, I just want to talk about the suspension because they're having some pretty big changes there. Still running McPherson strut at the front, but there is a custom upright that you just alluded to. Can you tell us what the advantages of that upright are over the stock hub? Yeah, it just gives you superior geometry, you know, options, um, you know, any dive, all that sort of stuff that you just can't get with a standard upright. Um, 
you know, obviously weights there as well is a weight issue uh, that you can overcome. And, you know, it's just basically to get the geometry where it needs to be optimal for what we need, what we can get with a McPherson strut. So in terms of the geometry there, obviously there's your, your camber, your caster, your toe, but sort of more subtle things like the ability to, I assume that you can adjust your roll centre height as well as uh, the likes of your bump steer. Yeah, all the low hanging fruit we can get a, get a handle on and uh, that's, that gives you that little edge and that's what, that was the decision process to go that, down that path. Yeah. All right, so moving to the rear of the car, uh, the S chassis had a lot of development and most guys are running the standard multi-link rear end with the Nissan subframe, but you've gone a little bit above and beyond there. Can you tell us what you've done there? Yeah, so it's got a, uh, like a double wishbone rear end, obviously into a subframe that bolts into the standard pickup points on the S chassis. So that was a lot of work in that to get that worked out um, and make sure everything clears on full bump and, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff. But that was, that was a, a major component of the car. It helps massively with obviously your geometry and power down group. That's, uh, probably one of the biggest advantages you know when you're running upward of you know 900 horsepower at the tires you know you really need that grip to be superior and it, it's just hard to achieve that with the standard uh, you know bolt-on kit application with the S chassis yeah yeah and you're always going to be compromised when you're dealing with a production car suspension setup never really designed for for going around uh, Eastern Creek and in, in the 120 vicinity all right so moving on to that aero package so obviously again uh, you've mentioned designed by Barry Locke there uh, have you got some sort of idea on numbers of what what sort of uh, downforce it is producing? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, downforce, we're, you know, we're around a thousand kilo mark um, uh, optimal downforce, so that's, that's you know, quite substantial. Uh, what sort of speed is that producing there? 180 kilometers an hour is like the, the speed that that's all calculated on, so, uh, so plenty of downforce. Uh, obviously, you need to push that along as well, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, yeah, uh, yesterday on low boost, we got in fifth gear and uh, it just wouldn't go any faster. So I needed to put the boost up and uh, just be able to pull another gear. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is always that trade off yeah. of the, yeah, yeah. the downforce is great, but uh, often with downforce comes a, a lot more drag. So, yeah, yeah. so we're seeing a lot of these pro cars, um, their terminal speed down the end of the front straight may not be as high as you'd expect given the power, but the ability to actually hold that speed straight through turn one is, is really where the advantage is. Yeah. Uh, you haven't actually mentioned the weight of the car so far. Where's, where's that sitting? Uh, we're just under 11. 100 kilos somewhere there, um, you know, with uh, liquids in it. So uh, you know, it's 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 a little bit heavy, but it's. Um you know, there's, there's a bit of room there for, to, for some improvements, but you know, we've also got some glass in the car and you know, we've got metal roofs and things like that. It's, you know, most of the panels aren't carbon and some fiberglass panels there. So there, there is some stuff we can do, uh, but you know, just with the nature of uh, getting a build together and then it lasts you know, a few months uh, before an event, you've got to sort of make some little compromises and uh, you know, it's something we can work on. Yeah. And in terms of the class you're running in, the open class, there are some rules around the aero that limit you compared to those running in pro or uh, pro am. Can you tell us where those sort of differences lie, in particular talking here about uh, what you've done with the underbody? Yeah, so you've got obviously, you know, three three boxes that you can work within um, in the open class, just like any other class. So obviously the open class is limited to, you know, widths and lengths and things like that. So we just have to work in with that um, and just make the, you know, maximum advantage of what we can do. And I think that's where we're sort of at. Oh, look, you've done a 129 yesterday in, in practice on a car that at that point had some handling issues that you, you've now worked through. Uh, we're into competition day here on Saturday and uh, we wish you all the best for the rest of the event. Looking yeah. forward to seeing what the car can do, particularly with a little bit more of a development. So thanks for the chat there. No, very good. Thank you very much. Cheers, Andrew.
you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.